OK, so. Uh, thank you everyone for being here and uh, thank you very much, Manuel, for accepting our invitation for this uh, convergence lecture. Uh, this is the, the first of uh, the second series of convergence lectures that we are doing in CTS. And um, as you know, the main theme of these lectures have to do with the convergence between many things, between translation and technology, between academia and the industry. And it is really a privilege to start this series with Manuel Herranz, uh, because Manuel uh, is one of those people that has a very long experience, not only of the industry, but also of research. He has been involved in many European uh, projects, very impactful, most of them. Uh, and he is the CEO of a very important machine translation company, Pangianic. Um, and yes, Manuel has been talking about uh, very different uh, themes all over his career. And he is, uh, of course, very focused on artificial intelligence, large language models, all of these new technologies that are out there. Uh, but you will be able to see how uh, broad uh, Manuel's perspective of, of all of these world is. Um, mm -hmm. I hope there will be plenty of questions. Let me just also explain to everyone that we are using um, a mode of uh, Microsoft Teams that um, disabled the chat. Um, and any questions that you want to ask, you should use the Q&A feature that you can see on your top bar. Um, these features allows you to ask the questions without creating any interference to, uh, to Manuel's presentation. Uh, and you can see for each question that appears a thumbs up. You can use that thumb to upvote the questions so that at the end I can choose the questions that have more uh, interest uh, so that we can have uh, a good conversation at the end. OK, Sabina, I don't know if you want to say uh, anything and maybe we can then pass the floor to uh, to Manuel. Uh, you're making me fight my micro my microphone button. No, no, no. I think um, uh, we have uh, cut uh, enough into Manuel's time. I, I, uh, I think we leave our comments for the discussion. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. All right. Uh, okay. Um, thank you. So uh, just one, uh, just one comment, uh, Felix. Panjenik um, is not a machine translation company. Uh, we used to be. Uh, a machine translation company or oh, the flagship product was uh, MTE for some time. We are uh, an NLP company uh, providing both NLP services or solutions to governments and, and companies and above all. Data data for AI, which we fed um, quite a few systems. Um, Home assistant that everybody knows. I don't need to mention to large stack, and we've been the company behind some developments in in translation, in machine translation uh, for large tech, let's say from from Silicon Valley. Uh, so yes, MT is, is one of our solutions, but we also work with much larger companies than than us, improving the the systems with data, and this journey has allowed us to um, become more familiar with some concepts that you may have heard about, like ethical AI, anonymization, pseudonymization, PII, personal data, etc., which have had more or a higher or a lower degree of, of importance in some cases, some other cases none. But since we led a, a European Commission project called MAPA, which was the first multilingual anonymizer for uh, public administrations, it was based on BERT, multilingual BERT, etc., and is now in use by, by e-translation, the service at the Commission, we began a small journey on privacy, on data anonymization, which has also allowed us to to uh, make our pitch, for lack of a better word, more uh, more solid. Um, and Manuel, just just one question. Um, yeah. you should. We're not seeing your slides. 
Can you, oh, you uh, check the screen? sharing uh, of your screen again? Okay. Maybe, oh. you know, redo it. Yeah, well, I must have lost it somehow. Yeah. OK, let's. OK. How about now? Yes, not in okay. presentation view, but um, yeah, we see the slides. OK, well, at least it works. OK, yeah, perfect. So, OK, so uh, just getting through that, um, I'm going to speak about um, natural language processing or at least one one area within NLP. NLP is a branch of artificial intelligence. As we know, AI nowadays is a very hot topic. Everybody talks about AI. I want to clarify one thing. Um, a lot of the talk that we see nowadays with the label AI is actually automation and it's what we used to call engineering three years ago, but you know, the cat is out of the bag and, and everybody's is talking about AI and everybody's using AI, even if it means changing changing a, a light bulb. Uh, we do something very specific, which is NLP, language processing, which is part of um, artificial intelligence. And I'm saying this because uh, before I move on, I'd like to step backwards a little bit and see what people, how people thought of technology uh, 120 years ago. And what we see 120 years ago is a very clever guy in France uh, with these cartoons, imagining that in the future we will have a chat GPT. We would have a machine where the, closely where the teacher is sitting, where you would feed books and books and, and writings and articles to this machine, and all this knowledge will be, would be condensed and sent to to um, to the students' brains by a, by a kind of some headsets. Okay, it was pretty advanced also in in, in foreseeing that people would have headsets to listen to to podcasts and all knowledge. Uh, this was a, a cartoon that was uh, that you would get in a packet of cigarettes in 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 France at uh, the beginning of the 20th century. However, what we find, and this is a danger that uh, or the dangers that I'm going to talk about today, is that when we when a new technology comes to us, we cannot escape our frame of mind. We cannot escape the times we live in. And we cannot foresee the dangers or the repercussions or the ripples of change that will come with that, with that technology. So, so, so the same guy that was quite a, a visionary, um, imagining that knowledge could be condensed in a machine, um, drew a picture and another cartoon of how communications would be in the year 2000 and communications and of course you know at his time the latest technology were um, airplanes and the latest and, and, and the highest form of living was a skyscraper so in the future he imagined uh, postmen would deliver the letters in uh, using aircraft some kind of an aircraft because that is the latest of the latest that we have today. Of course, he could not imagine that communications would change so dramatically that would be delivered electronically. And the, the simple concept of letter opposement would uh, disappear. So, that is my message to you uh, today. As the technology advances, um, so do, uh, but legislation tends to lag behind. So we see a growing concern with the way personal data is being is being used. Um, every country had uh, data protection acts or laws 20 years ago, but they, th these laws were more concerned about cyber security and not letting, you know, making sure that your servers were were safe, etc. It's only when we find models that tap on people's times and where people start sharing their own personal details, of course, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, uh, and pictures and the children's pictures and the cats and dogs, that some regulation is called upon. And the first region in the world to 
provide a privacy, well, to draft a privacy legislation was uh, was was Europe with GDPR. Um, now, compare this to the advancements of, of technology. Right up to 2003, uh, we had statistical models that worked more or less well with uh, CPUs, with the computing power that we have. We even had rule-based systems in, in machine translation or even in AI. AI was mostly rule-based. We had, you had a tons of rules, whether you're doing, you were doing MT or you were doing uh, processing, again, and you did what you could. It's only with the advent of much higher technologies that then people are moving, moving much faster. Neural machine translation, for example, or neural networks based NLP. And I'm not going to mention what happens with LLMs and, and much higher, much higher or more, um, more sophisticated uh, AI technologies that provide a cognitive experience. And that is the danger or the shock that all of us have had this year. For the first time in history, we are having a cognitive experience with a machine. The, we, humans are not very good at discerning what is reality or, and what is not reality. You know, we wake up from, from a dream and sometimes we believe we are in the dreams. And you know, and as, as we look back at our memory, sometimes we have trouble and say, well, did that actually happen or did Felix said that to me or didn't say it? Um, On the other hand, um, when we began chatting with ChatGPT, the beginning of the of the of the year, late late 21, sorry, late 22, we saw that machine was generating text and was replying to our requests with the same flow and naturalness that a human being could answer. Sometimes, most of the time, the, the questions, the answers, the answers were shallow, but the computing power behind it was making our access to knowledge very, very scalable. With regards to the training, okay, this is where the trouble, the trouble begins. When, if we're dealing with rule-based systems, or SMT, we use typically our own resources, I'm taking machine translation as, as an example, Everybody use the same TMXs coming, uh, translation uh, memory files coming from the United Nations or from uh, DGT in Europe and mix them with a little bit more or less enterprise data and produce some systems. With NMT, we could have systems, we could have machines that produce training data as well. So we, we could have machines producing machine data at scale. And coincidentally, that is when GDPR, uh, GDPR came, came in force. We had tons more data coming. And guess what? Within that data, there were also many people's details, many personal details. If we look at LLMs, the way they've been trained, um, we're not speaking, we're not talking about you know, some um, TMXs with uh, Euro and peace details and names. We're talking about the whole of the internet. Whatever you published ten years ago is there. That person you commented and all the comments on that page are on there. If you change the post, it doesn't matter because Common Crawl keeps a copy of all the and updated pages. So it has tons and tons of personal data. Uh, and that is going on the training, unfiltered. Uh, apart from that, LLMs have been trained on Wikipedia, as, as we know, and have been trained on, on a recipe of, of books for um, for better generation. Um, the window in which we are also having this cognitive experience is much much bigger. When we we're dealing with rule-based systems and SMT. We're looking at very short, uh, very narrow windows, five and grams. Five and grams could be anything between three to five words. Uh, in an MT, the window of attention, attention window, was whole sentence. And okay, we had some, a little bit 
of a cognitive experience, but we knew we were reading the results of a machine and some errors there because the window, okay, even though much bigger, even though it was much, much bigger, it was still limited to a sequence to sequence, sentence in, sentence out. With uh, Gen AI, we are looking at, com at a completely different animal, an animal that can produce, that has an attention window, but began with 8,000 words and is now 64,000 words, which is basically a dissertation. So it has the power to see where it's going and move its uh, output uh, better. And that, that, that is what, what produces that is what produces this, this cognitive experience. Just to add some numbers here and put the personal data in context, uh, ChatGPT, not ChatGPT, GPT-4 basically is the same, but with some more neural networks on top of it would make it more secure and more guided better. But basically, basically the, the core system is, is the same. Has to use the internet, mm on a ratio of 20 times the, 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 the rest of the material. So it has used common crawl, 60%, uh, and what to text, which is basically also um, web-based material, uh, to make it 82% of the training, uh, of the training corpora on, on it. Now that is a massive amount of, of data. Of personal data. So if you ask ChatGPT who is Manuel Ferrans, ChatGPT of course has my details, more or less updated, and uh, it tells you who I am without any permission. This is a company processing my data, telling details about what I do, who I am, possibly a lot more data that you can see here without my permission. Uh, and I don't know about you, but Okay, I, I don't I don't really do anything illegal, narco style, but uh, everything what I do is pretty pretty public. But I just don't like the fact that people can tell stories without my permission. Uh, maybe some people are more lax or 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 don't care so much about their privacy, but I don't think it's good. I don't think it's um, I don't, I don't know, how, how would I say? I don't think it's, um, I don't think this company has the right to offer information about me without my consent. Now, if I've given my consent to Google to spy and, and to to read my emails to improve, so they say, the, the Gen AI system or the prediction system, okay, okay, at least they provide the service. ChatGPT doesn't. So I urge you to check what ChatGPT knows about you because he knows about my daughter as well. And my daughter's underage. But obviously, my daughter apparently happened to be with me in some web page or picture. Um, and then the information changes as well. Um, there was some confusion about some Manuel Ferrances. It's not a very common name, but uh, there are enough around. Now, uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT, just phone on me if you ask uh, about my name. Now, personal data is very, very, very valuable. What we do as people is extremely valuable. And most of us don't know that just three years ago, every person on Earth, including the poor guys in, in Central Africa that have very limited access to Internet, produced 1.7 megabytes of personal data, not of data, of personal data. Uh, and that was collected. Uh, and, and that was collected by companies that have utilized this, this data for their own purposes. So uh, there have been efforts by governments becoming aware of the potential misuse of people's data. Um, and okay, there have been some acts and, and laws being passed. Um, the EU is probably, but the EU is not actually the most stringent. It's, it's the one that came out, it's the one that has is known to be put in, in, in force, and there are some fines. 
uh, but the EU doesn't send you to prison if you contravene uh, people's people's rights to data or you're not careful uh, keeping your client's data safe. The, the, the most stringent um, is the Japanese um, is the Japanese law, API, which can send you to prison. Nobody has. And the trouble is that they don't apply. They don't take it as serious as, as companies or EU institutions do or national bodies do. Uh, Brazil also has a very strict law on personal data. They just don't apply it. Um, and the US has little to none. There are some efforts in California, CPA, Virginia has passed another law, Colorado has passed another law, but you can opt out either of it because personal data is, is, is big business uh, over there. And apparently you can mine European citizens' data, or Chinese, Chinese not, but Japanese, you can mine data from other countries and store in the US and there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's a completely legal, it's a completely legal uh, activity. So, um, why would it be a concern about our data being part of training sets? Uh, and we make sure in Pangeonic that when we manufacture data, be data for machine translation systems, for questions and answer systems, for monolingual data, monolingual data for LLMs, we make sure that, that there are not uh, any personal details in, in there. Um, well, because we could be, we, it's very ingrained in our working system that not only we could be doing something that is against the law, but we could be doing something that is not ethical because then the results, the data that you put in an algorithm can always be as extracted with the right so and and you don't know you in, in the tons and tons of training data when beta scientists come to come to your data they just don't know they don't have the time to look in there and see if there is a michael a peter a felix or emmanuel mentioned or the activities that all these people have uh, have engaged in so um and, and that they are aware that there can be a misuse on, on, on this data if, if our personal details go in there. We've been involved in projects with hospitals, for example, to extract knowledge from X-ray material where we had to anonymize. For very good reasons, people uh, were asked, asked to share their X-rays because, you know, what happens to oh, so many people in an X-ray, this tumor, this cancer, this treatment, has gone down uh, with this. Um, it, this is very good material for people that are working on, on algorithms and and in order to see if certain treatments are, are improving. Now, having access to your x-ray, your lungs, your your guts, your heart, your liver, maybe your, your, your AIDS record, maybe it's not palatable for for everybody but if you anonymize this data this is extremely good uh, extremely good uh, training material for algorithms that can benefit society as as a whole so uh, we work in what is called the data minimization principle always use the minimum data that you need to get some results out, uh, some results out and always looking at, uh, and always being, being very, very careful that no personal details are there. Now, if you ask me, well, Manuel, but I, I've never had cancer, I don't smoke, I'm healthy, I've not had an x-ray. Still, you can't imagine how many items with IoT collect data from you. And I'm not talking just about uh, your mobile phones is, is the first thing that we think about. Your washing machine collects data. Your dishwasher collects data. Uh, truck delivery companies collect data. Whether you had a pizza delivered to your house or a hamburger, fish and chips, uh, they all collect data and trends and what you do. One of our uh, clients became a client of ours for um well after some conversations and our job to them is to anonymize iot data 
And this IoT data is collected from people's homes because they need to monitor. It's a very well known German home appliance manufacturer. Uh, because they, uh, the data they collect is the electricity consumption, the programs that you use to wash the dishes, etc. Uh, so they know your your electricity usage patterns. Um, and if you happen to have the app of the oven, uh, the, the, the cooking app, you can even share. You can even share um, cooking recipes and pictures of these cooking recipes through it. So their fear was that they were collecting personal details from the the serial number of the dishwasher or the washing machine. But people were also uploading pictures not only of the beautiful spaghetti my daughter has cooked for the first time tonight, but my daughter and her friend eating the spaghetti, or me and my daughter eating the spaghetti, so eating pizza. And when they saw that the app was being populated with people's pictures and people's and children's pictures, they freaked out and we were called in and now they have a system where, whereby all this all this data is, is masked. Um, now, unluckily, there are very few solutions out there in the market. There are very good solutions for bunkerizing data and cyber security. So even though people like Gardner say data masking is a mature market, it really is not because data, personal data is, is everywhere. And we don't realize how much pers how many personal details we are sharing through our use of uh, large language models or chats, chatbots. Uh, that not only can provide dubious information sometimes or false information, but we hardly share, share pictures there. So this reminds me really of the days when Facebook came out and everybody was uploading the pictures from 10 years ago when they graduated from university and when I was five. Children's pictures on Facebook, we've become a little bit more alert and mature, but uh, it's exactly the same that is happening with with large language models. We talk to a machine, we fool ourselves uh, because we have so much fun time and we share things that we should not share. So, OK, what is what is ethical AI uh, and why would companies, organizations, governments work on ethical AI? Um, on ethical AI uh, rules or basis, there are four pillars that make ethical AI. Um, uh, AI should always be transparent, should be fair, should be private, which is what we are discussing today, and should be accountable. So whatever systems you build, the systems should be transparent. Transparent. People should be able to look in the system or customize the, customize the system, should at least understand how systems are built. And this is the reason why OpenAI and Meta were so open about how they built uh, the first uh, systems, the first large language model, Lama 1, Lama 2. Lama 2 is an example of well-documented and open uh, an open system, the chatbot LLM system. OpenAI stops publishing how the secret recipe or how they they done things after ChatGPT 3.5. So that's not very transparent. The minute that you cannot understand how AI is being made, that is not ethical AI. In this respect, I have to give you know, hats off for Meta uh, and their Lama model and most of the models they, they, they release. Um, OK, yeah, it has to be fair, obviously. It should be trained on, on, in ways that do not represent discrimination of some groups versus others. Should be um, concerned about privacy. None of them are. None of them are because the training material used is web-based, is anything that happened on the web. 
and should be accountable. And to my to my knowledge, none, uh, no, no um, large big tech company is accountable. Sometimes they're fined for breaching data, but that is not accountancy. They, they happily pay and and move on. So I, I think uh, our take in Europe really is 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 different. Europe is probably somebody said 10 years behind and 10 billion dollars behind the US in this respect. But if we advanced, if we are forward looking in something is in regulations, in thinking how AI can affect people's rights. OK, and this is the, the purpose of the initial, uh, the initial French cartoons. Let's think about the ripples and the consequences of uh, deploying something that even children can use happily before we release it there and put some, not barriers, but put some guardrails there so companies also understand that not all technology is always good. Um, okay, uh, this is some, some, some of the dangers that uh, we can face if we don't adhere to the four pillars of ethical AI. Um, obviously, some groups can be dis discriminated to. Um, you could be um, decisions on, on, on lending could be uh, worked against you because of your because of your record, because because of the data you are false that we have on, on you. Um, and then some other clear the, the some other clear dangers. Uh, just imagine that w one thing that can happen and probably will happen is the use of large language models to mimic people on social media and create tons and tons of content that can pose as actors, actresses, or or other people, or and publish uh, misinformation uh, online. So. In order to fight this, um, and I'll be very quick here, there are anonymization has uh, has four ways in which can be applied: reduction, obfuscation, anonymization. You can monetize people's data and and still be compliant with the use if you use seed anonymization. So one is that one uh, technique that is very clear is is reduction. Everybody knows that all these black lines that we've seen. Uh, everywhere. Obfuscation is a term that technically is used for images only. So this little guy here and that registration plate are obfuscated. We don't see the person's face. We don't see the registration number anymore. Uh, anonymization as a technical means everything, but specifically uh, it's used only for databases. If we are, for example, in this case, uh, applying bonuses to people. We apply bonuses very fairly because of something that has been done without looking at their sex or gender or their gender or looking at what they, um, their names, which could be a giveaway of their, of their personal background. And then there are tons of, of other much simpler uh, animation techniques like hashing, averaging that, uh, or shuffling uh, data within a document that can be applied, applied ad hoc. Uh, Pseudonymization is the most attractive of all of them because uh, you can use pseudonyms to substitute one thing for uh, another and then produce data that is still good for machine learning, yet it doesn't convey uh, the user's information. Uh, I mentioned MAPA, our project here. Uh, MAPA, MAPA, MAPA's web is still live and you can use it in a couple of languages. We, can, we can't deploy all the models in all the domains, but it does work in, in a couple of languages. Uh, it's completely open source. You can download it from our GitLab uh, release and from the European language grid as well. Uh, and Magic. You can you can start applying it. You can start applying anonymization like this to some of the, your documents if you if you need to to share it. So just to wrap up, what we learned today, what we dealt, um, what we dealt with today is the concept of ethical AI. Um, ask 
companies, how they refer to the four pillars of ethics in their building, whether they've been knowledgeable, whether they have been concerned or they've taken into account. The four pillars, the transparency, accountability, uh, privacy, etc. Um, when they build their solutions and always have them in mind when you when you build um, any kind of artificial intelligence solution. And that's all I had to say about that. That's as I said. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, that was a very compact presentation of lots of interesting things. Um, you could take more time. We could. Uh, you have been very uh, economic in your time, but uh, yeah. So um, we can use this time to to ask Manuel easy and not so easy questions. Uh, like I said, you covered lots of, lots of ground, and there are already at least two questions. Okay, mm -hmm. so maybe I'll go. I'll start with this. If anyone wants to uh, to ask any question and to use their cameras, you can raise your hands, use the button on at the top bar, and we can also uh, help you pop up your camera and, and ask your questions directly. Okay, yeah. But um, so I have one question from Stravula Sokoli, and she says that today ChatGPT, so ChatGPT uh, 3.5 doesn't know who Manuel Herans is. So really? Check. Yeah. And she says, well, obviously they found out you were against it. Yeah. But the, <laughs> the actual question too is... Too popular, and too popular. Check, yeah. Take it about yourselves. Take it about yourselves. It's, it's, yeah. it's all I can say. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but the actual question is, what do you think about the fact that rules behind these interfaces are changed constantly? Right? You analyze one and then the next one comes with different, okay. different rules. Uh, How do you... Hmm. Yeah. That's that's a very very interesting question because as you could see, uh, ChatGPT produced personal data and descriptions uh, not long not long ago. That screenshot comes from July. Um, so how do you feel going to this rugby match, uh, kicking the ball and then finding out it's golf we're playing, and you don't have a stick? We don't know, right? If you change the rules of the game, then then we're not playing. You you yeah. just moving the the goalposts for mm -hmm. for your for yeah. your reasons. So I mean, providing a very good service, which is good. Okay, I'm not saying it's ChatGPT is very good tool, and it's a wonder of engineering. Uh, just knowing how it was built, the amount of, the engineering effort behind it is is tremendous. Is you know, it's, it's the colleagues um, of of our times doesn't give you the right to be killing gladiators all the time. Okay, it doesn't give you the, the right about life and death. You've built a very good thing. Uh, we're still not very clear on how this, this is going to be used. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes, you are providing a service. Very good service, very useful service. But we um, you haven't thought about the consequences of adding personal data to to the training material. So what you are doing now, what is what's happening now is you're building more and more and more and more layers of safety of safety or guardrails into into the core system, which is something that you know, anybody that's been around in machine translation or NLP uh, has 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 had a similar experience. You know, to have a core, which is the translator, call it Moses, call it whatever type of system, a uh, neural network, and then build some guardrails, gu guide the system to, to where you want to go with, to where you want to go. Um, there is one way of doing things, and at small scale, okay, it works. But when you are dealing with such a vast amount of data, uh, I don't think it's safe to just add neural networks and neural networks and more neural networks on, 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 on top of the LLM. You know, you're basically you have a bad heart and I'm just pumping your vitamins and and stuff to make you look like Superman and really, you know, really Schwarzenegger uh, type of person. 
uh, while your heart is not so good. So rather look after your heart, for your healthy heart, and then don't bother looking like Schwarzenegger. You, you'll be a very healthy person. Yeah, so we were talking about uh, entities that have very different sizes, right? The big companies that have these LLMs, and then yeah. we have industries like the localization industry that has a different type of size in the companies, right? Mm -hmm. And the challenge is really for, for everyone who doesn't have the power to have these LLMs. How do you mm -hmm. navigate this? How do you make business decisions? How do you decide your business models? I think this is the real, mm -hmm. the big question at the moment, right? How, how will the industry change? Yeah, at a smaller level, you know, people like us, um, we, we should be careful with 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 data uh, and always ensure that we adhere to to the principles. We are asked by our clients uh, to run an anonymization or to spot uh, personal data on on the sets that we work on, which sometimes can be synthetic. Okay, we do generate synthetic data for some applications, uh, but that synthetic data may have some personal details because we use several systems where people's details or the prompt uh, must carry or needs to carry a, a, a name, an area, a John or a Peter in order to act properly or to, to produce uh, to produce text well. Uh, so anonymization is, is something that we run um, always or see the anonymization if, if we can't. And anything we build, we make sure you know, the four principles. We have a poster here in the office. We make sure that the, the, the principles are there. If you are in a commercial setting, clients sooner or later will ask you how things were built. And you need to explain. You, you need to be forward with it. Okay, so we use this, we use that. Okay. We don't obviously give away the whole recipe of how you dig things, but your technology has to be explainable. So this is this is connected to the next question that I'm going to ask you because it it is it focuses on the individual and the institutional levels, and the question is, and it comes from Mohammed Ragab, um, is it ethical ethical to initiate and widely use AI on individual and institutional levels as a tool before regulating its functions and damages, which doesn't look like it's something that is going to be fixed now or in the future. Are there justifications for these? Are there ongoing consultations for solutions? What, how do you see this at the moment? I mean, use, is it ethical using it at yeah. government level? Um, it's unstoppable. You know, it's unstoppable. You cannot make people go back to typewriters if there are computers and internets. Um, it's unstoppable. What we have, what we must do is be very aware of the dangers or the potential consequences they can have. Uh, for example, one of the biggest, the biggest organization in every country that holds most personal data is anybody knows? No candidates. Who has the most personal data in any country? In every country, actually. Personal data. Personal data. I wouldn't guess. Facebook, Google. Yeah, one of those. <laughs> I don't know. No, 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 no the government. No, no, not by far. No, no, no. It's government. It's the public it's administration. Government. Public administrations have tons and tons of personal data, which can be used, and data in general, which can be used for very good purposes to protect us, for example to protect us, to fight against terrorism, to fight against many things, to heal us if it's used properly, social security system, medical records, etc. Uh, a history of what, you know, anything that we suffered since we were kids. So government, you know, the, the state can look after us in, in very good ways, but uh, it can be used in very bad ways. So number one, all these recommendations, the, 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 the organization, number one, that should be looking at them and respected them uh, should be government mm -hmm. in all its shapes. Yeah, and people who have been around for a while know how inefficient sometimes uh, even fine technology 
but it's mm -hmm. used in such an inefficient way. Uh, I'm going to jump one of the questions. I'm going through them more or less as they come in. I'm mm -hmm. going to jump one question um, and go to Miguel Jimenez Crespo's question about that comparison that you did at the beginning. Some people are using the term AI to refer to things that are basically automation, right? Uh, yeah. and, and Miguel's question is, what would be, in your opinion, a true case of ethical and successful AI implementation in the language or translation industry today? Do you have one such example? That's, a, that, that's, that's harder than the last question. <laughs> That's harder than the last question. Uh, and if, not completely. All, all the examples that come to mind can be can be criticized. Mm -hmm. If not in the deployment, which is probably quite naive and, and well hearted and you know that doesn't mean any harm. But if you but it's not transparent, so there's always a cloud of of doubt of how has this been built or the companies behind it. However, I have to say that there are companies that are doing the utmost to at least come clean on, on previous experiences or lead generally, quite generally, uh, a new open source, a new op wave of open source models, okay? I'm not a, I'm not gonna, run any adverts or publicity on, on anybody, but really I, I came out of all Facebook and Meta products some time ago. I don't have WhatsApp. I don't have well, the Facebook. It still exists, but I, I don't use them. Uh, because when I found out that they, they use the value of my data on my Meta products was about $20 a month when I was contributing to the company just posting where I was and what coffee was I was having and my visit to the zoo and, and you know, I only get the milk from my wife um, on, the, on the way home. That is worth 20, probably more now, probably 30 or 40 dollars a month. There is the value of the data that us people are sending to Meta every day. Now, Meta is also the company uh, okay, through selling ads. Meta is also the company that is that is releasing wonderful and wonderful uh, open source models for the community to experiment. Something that we would never be able to to build ourselves because the one training costs in the region of ten or twenty million dollars. Uh, so number one, they, they're very good in the way that they do the training. We can do the fine tuning, and there is less less pollution. The, the CO two footprint is much less, and our fine tuning. And when we have, we do have something that is more or less as powerful as a chat GPT, but can be customized for many, many solutions. Um, I've not come back to WhatsApp and Facebook yet, but uh, we do use Llama over here and it does produce very, very good results. So um, it's not good and bad. It's not cowboys and Indians here. It's the landscape is, is very, it's still new. Everything is so new that it's so mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, and we only beginning to realize now the limitations of the technology, which is also advancing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you another question that is still related to how the industry and the companies are reacting to this. And then maybe we can move to a few other questions about the individual level, how, how all of this affects us as individuals. So this comes from Laura Ramirez Polo, um, and she says, it seems that efforts to build and deploy ethical AI systems stem from the companies who are developing these technologies, mm -hmm. uh, while they are also balancing the pressure of a disorganized race to outpace each other in the advancement of AI. Do you think that the private sector will be able to self-regulate or will we need some sort of institutional intervention? And if so, considering how slow public institutions are, will these interventions be possible? Uh, very good, uh, completely right. Uh, we will need regulations. Otherwise, companies per, per se, because of their free will, will not comply. And yeah, then makes we sense. Will yeah, we will have to speak to our um, 
American cousins and Chinese cousins and Australian cousins uh, and Indian cousins and say, look, uh, we, we need to come to an agreement. You know, if, if I do these things, if if this is not allowed in my jurisdiction, in my region, uh, perhaps it's a good idea that you shouldn't do it either on, on your jurisdiction because, OK, I can ban certain things in, in Europe, but if I have a, uh, a computer farm in, I'm not going to say a country, but let's say Saudi Arabia or Turkey or Bolivia, it doesn't matter. Uh, the internet is free, you know, I can, I can, uh, I can expose European or American or Australian or whatever population to exactly the same risks. So it has to be a global, a global, uh, a global agreement, number one. Uh, or at least th have the ability to find people that operate in certain regions. So if you're operating from, let's say, Antarctica, okay? um, but your business and, and what you're doing happens in, in Europe or Africa, right? it will be African countries, it will be European countries that will find you. Yeah. On that note, like I said, maybe we can move to some questions regarding uh, risks for individuals. The question I skipped a while ago came from um, Duote Yu, and it asks if you could elaborate a bit more on how AI has the potential or the risk to discriminate people. And maybe here, as you were mentioning, these mm. differences between regions, you can also um, mention how different this can be, you know, in the US and the way they mm. build regulation and in Europe and how. Yeah. Regulation is is created in Europe. Yeah, well, uh, I, can, I can mention the typical example everybody mentions about recruitment in, with a company in London, and that was fed with mostly white people's faces. So, uh, in re in the recruitment process, so it came to the conclusions that no black people uh, were were capable of doing the job the company had advertised for. But that's a very very well known case. Uh, but I can give you one that is more personal to us. We failed uh, a proposal, a Eureka proposal with a Turkish company for which we were going to uh, build a similar system, um, considering what could happen, okay, to, to precisely overcome um, uh, those potential risks by blurring people's faces and, and, and applying um, filters to people's voices so you couldn't tell the accents by anonymizing CVs, etc., in order to speed um, recruitment processes. And, uh, and the, so the, you had all the bias, all the anti-bias guardrails built in there and everything. And the, the project was approved initially on the first cut and it was refused on the second on the second round it was a two stage because of the potential misuse so even though the system was transparent um even though we told uh, how we would build the system with all the guardrails in order not to precisely not to discriminate the evaluator said but it can be reversed and you can use this to actually discriminate with against people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's very easy to build discrimination in any AI system. Just don't show it what don't show it. What you want to discriminate against. Yeah, so the next two questions are related to this question that you are mentioning now of transparency. One of them comes from Sabina. Maybe uh, afterwards you can elaborate a bit more, Sabina. But the question there is how far does transparency needs to go to be really useful to an individual or ordinary user? And L added a point here, which is also related to this, which is um, nowadays you have these attempts to create interfaces that pretend to be human. They are more friendly than ever. And you have, you know, visual reproductions of faces and facial expressions and so on. Um, don't don't all of these attempts to make the transparency become human also contribute to creating a difficulty here for people to yeah. can you comment yeah. on that yeah uh, this reminds me i'm not saying if, if i'm going to be very straightforward in the answer but I, yeah, 
I'll tell you what I'm thinking about just now. It reminds me of uh, something that I saw recently on the dangers, dangers of digital twins. So, OK, the concept of a digital twin has been around for quite a long time and always on a positive note. OK, you could have an assistant that run your hairdresser's appointments, bookings for you, etc. OK, that's that's very useful. If I if I could have a digital twin running through all my emails every day, it would be a great help because we moved from having a secretary who typed our letters 50 years ago to so everybody being his or her own secretary because half of the time we, 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 what we do during the day is just uh, answer emails. Now this, uh, okay, while the digital twin was a bot and it was clear it was a bot, there was no danger. Now the, the virtual reality is becoming so, so indistinguishable from humans that is very difficult to tell. Um, I, I saw um, I, I saw one two days ago. It was it was very difficult to tell. the The girl was not real, and it was faking a different uh, different name. Now, I foresee that with the advances on AI, uh, digital twins or virtual assistants are going to become so clever that we will be able to afford having two or three, four or five, to take over large chunks of our lives. with the hope that we will have more time to be more creative, you know, the, the typical the, the, the typical stuff that you've been hearing from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, have more time for ourselves, more free time, more creative, da da da. Uh, now, the consequences here can be, what if one of my bots, and I have, let's imagine that I have five bots. One is on the stock market trading all the time, so okay, it's so making a few bob for me, okay? It's making 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 100 pounds every day. Good, I, I like that bot. I have another bot that plus answers some emails for me. At least what I've been, what I've trained that bot to be more relevant or less relevant. Okay, sounds good. I have one that, you know, reminds me when I need to go to the hairdressers or order food. So my fridge is always etc. Uh, what would happen? And then I have one that is able to negotiate. Okay, something that Facebook tried to do like five years ago um, and stopped because the bots were using a language that nobody could understand. And then when, when the, the negotiation turned into a, a, a language that was not understandable, they, they closed it. Um, what if one of these bots gives, gives the wrong answer and gets me into trouble or buys stuff that I don't need and I don't want to pay for or uh, answers with, with very good intentions, not what I want to answer to this person. Then Felix or Constantine here could be pretty upset because you know, they wanted to meet me on the 5th and looking at my calendar, I don't uh, I'm not available anymore on the fifth or, or whatever. Um, is AI is AI uh, liable for that? Is it liable in the way that my cat and my dog are liable because they're my property? Yeah. My dog and my cat can harm, can can do some harm, not intentionally, but can harm. Uh, and then I would be liable. Will £100 insurance on a bad decision by a bot be enough to cover the damage that I I caused Felix for not turning up today? Because, you know, the bot decided I had something better to do than present. And then my attention was focused somewhere else and this was a no-show. Yes. Would that reputational damage be worth you know doing so we're opening new scenarios here mm -hmm. that we simply can't see it's a little bit of a black mirror situation yeah, yeah. 
I'm going to pass the microphone to Sabina. You can mute your microphone, Sabina, if you want to elaborate a bit more on this thing. I guess you would. Yeah, I, I was curious what your thoughts are on, on, you know, really how far transparency should be taken and how, uh, because I think a lot of what you just said has to do with this, um, not all of it, but I mean, that, that, that there's a myriad of questions there, but um, but one is, of course, how how traceable or transparent all these things are to us. And um, so you earlier in your presentation, of course, you gave the you know the definition of transparency that these um, apart from you know as, as part of the whole idea of ethical ai that that this should be sort of understandable and explainable but i have often thought that perhaps we also need a debate what we what we really want to understand by this so how far we need to take mm -hmm. transparency so that say an individual also a non-technical user um, maybe, yes, somebody who once has all these beautiful digital assistants, but doesn't actually really know how, like most people, how yeah. this works mm. behind the scenes. So, you know, I mean, to give a sort of slightly trivial example in in this context now is, you know, so, yes, um, how was a machine translation solution adopted um, and how or why were sort of certain alternatives for that translation discarded by a machine. So you see that you could really kind of trace what it does. Will we mm. ever achieve this? Is this necessary or does this completely go against the grain of how these systems work? So so maybe we no, can talk a bit about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. So that's what we call guardrails in, into a system. Um, LLMs, you know, if you take the raw LLM, produces a lot of, it never stops because it's a, Gen generative AI, so it just produces text and text. And, and so one of the first guardrails that you have, have to put into it is don't produce something any longer than 400, 800, whatever you want to do. Don't mention anything. And then have lots of humans classifying answers into safe mode. For example, an example of transparency uh, is the, the paper by, by, by Meta by the Meta team, uh, headed by Jan Le Kuhn, on how Lama was built. It's very good reading. Okay, it's not for everybody. It's not for my mum. Uh, but that suffices. You don't need to tell me everything, okay? Because obviously you need to keep your commercial secrets. So it's, the paper is not very clear on exactly how, where, where the data comes from, but they make clear it's not user data. And they use a larger proportion than OpenAI on, uh, from Common Crawl. From, from the web and then basically the more or less the same recipe but the engineering behind it is is I mean it's extremely very well documented can be replicated I'm not saying you know uh, open your door so we know all the secrets of course not you know people have to make money and there are certain things that need to be kept behind fine but you know be in transparent enough so you know when I go to your pizzeria, I can see on the wall, okay, that you, your produce is local produce and your tomatoes get okay, something that makes a story. Okay, I don't need to know that. I don't need to know how much you pay for your tomatoes to local growers. Okay, but I see the process. Okay, and the process is mm -hmm, uh, so that if I have any doubts, I can say, but these tomatoes don't taste local. Okay. And um, that's that, that's that help. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, please? sure, sure. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I think this is exactly you know where, where do we need to draw the line, but also how far do we need to go? So you know another commonly used example I think is insurance. You know how much do you have to pay for your insurance policy, car insurance, or whatever? Seems to be relatively intransparent. I know lots of people we compare, we all pay something different, and we have, we seem to have fairly common histories and so, so you know how far should a user of this kind of service be it an insurance service but also yes a translation service and other be really or how far is it really necessary to achieve transparency for a user to be able to fully understand why this insurance company or this translation company has made that decision that I pay in the insurance case say that I pay X so how much yes. of my personal data do they have to tell me they have processed and in which way? So and, and can we achieve that in numbers? So what's your view on that? Can we actually do that to come to the kind of regulation that would incorporate that sort of thing? 
um, well, with the law in your hand, you can't trade people's data. The reality is that it's, it's a huge market. We're not in, in that market. We, we're in the market of building data sets to build AI for specific purposes. But the personal data market, it's the dark web. It's the dark web. Look, this reminds me about just before the summer, somebody broke into one of the big or the, the biggest hospital, public hospital in Barcelona, uh, Val de Bron. And um, they stole four million records of everybody that gone there for whatever treatment, you know, headache or broken leg or cancer treatment, AIDS, whatever. Those details, apparently, the news was that the, um, those details were on the dark web two days, 48 hours later. So obviously somebody would pay for it. And whoever broke into the system and got the details knew that those details are extremely valuable because they contain the 4 million records of medical history. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very sad. But it, is, it, it does happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should start wrapping up. And there is one question here that I want to ask you. And I also have another question for you. Um, as you may have noticed, we have uh, had around 100 people in, in this uh, wow. in this lecture, which is very good. And there were many other questions happening uh, elsewhere. Um, well, you could tell from the, the ding sound that you were hearing while everyone was coming in that, yeah, we had a, a, a good number of people here. Uh, Carla Bonina asked the question about um, the, what you were talking specifically about the anonymization techniques. And she uh, she says that anonymization is not the silver bullet. It's impossible to de-anonymize data with a few data points. What are in your um, idea, the limits of data anonymization when you want to build ethical AI? Well, it works, I have to say, it works pretty well. Is it perfect? No, uh, but it's, it's, it can be very, very good. It can be very, very, with a high level of accuracy. In database, as Gardner was saying, database data masking is, is a very much on market because of at least it's ABC, you know, you, you know which columns have telephone numbers, surnames, or addresses. So, in unstructured data, it can be a little bit more difficult. But uh, depends on you. See, it, uh, it works can work pretty pretty well. You know, name identity recognition systems have advanced, and if you pay enough effort to to build your own system, you can do it. We have ours. We we sell ours to public administrations, um, and public administrations are our largest users by far. Uh, not the private sector. Um, yeah, you me, said that. Sorry, you said that you use this data minimization principle, right? You try to use as with, little data as you need. This is a force balance. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah if a system, reach, right? yeah, if a system can work with a thousand samples of people's faces, don't use ten thousand faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Make sure that your thousand faces contain uh, a representative enough of what you want to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's a very basic example because you wouldn't build any system with a thousand. But anyway, let's say 10,000. Um, and there are there are there, there is enough variety in there. Don't use 50,000 for what, numbers. I mean, just because if you have more, it doesn't mean it does. It is, it is better. Same happened mm -hmm. with machine translation some years ago. Yeah. You know, adding more data that didn't necessarily make the systems a lot better. A little bit of fine-tuned data, you know, sayings, proverbs, expressions, human feedback made the system better for what you wanted the system to do. It, general AI is, is the same. Now, going back to, to the question, uh, Felix, mm -hmm. of anonymization of being perfect, well, it's like, it's like um, having an alarm system on your house. If you leave if you go to work and you leave your windows open, your your door open, your gate open, and your back door open, something may happen. Okay, if you have an alarm system, 
and even you know large Doberman on 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 the in the garden, and your windows are closed. You may still be broken into, and somebody, but it becomes a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. So you know, do have the tools and do have the methods to make things a little bit more difficult. Is common sense. Yeah. So you talked, but this is my final question. Okay, uh, if someone else wants to ask any questions, maybe they can try to contact you and, yeah. and ask more questions. But my final question is again bringing this a bit uh, closer to home to the translation industry. You mm -hmm. were you talked about private data, and in the translation industry, we also have this notion of who owns the products mm -hmm. of translators' work. Right? Uh, is it the client? Is it the the company? Is it the the translator? Do you think that AI is going to change this discussion? Shall we go back to uh, starting this discussion again on how can we own the data that, for example, translators produce? How do you see this discussion at the moment? Another tough question, just to close, right? <laughs> Well, the, the the discussion on the ownership or the IP on on TM and translation memories stopped uh, some time ago, and uh, I think it's a joint. If I remember correctly, it's a joint ownership, so the translator always has some rights on it. Um, but since this is a commercial transaction, I I paid for this to be mine as well. So it, it's a joint, it's a joint ownership. Um, and my wife is a lawyer, so she, she, it's very clear to her. If you pay, who owns what? <laughs> um, yeah, you, you pay for your car, the car is yours, even though I drive it every day. You let me have your car. Okay? Uh, and I even can crash the car, but you pay for the car, the car is yours. Um, now, about the subject of AI generated translation, the um, discussions that I'm hearing lately are not so much about ownership, but about accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, because, well, to start with, the, 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 it makes very little sense to use LLMs for translation. They may sound very natural, but they cost double for in production, for, for production purposes, they cost double to run and they produce translation at half the speed as a neural network. So uh, when I was in Taos uh, two weeks ago, um, I was co-presenting with Christian Federman from Bing Translator, and we both said exactly the same thing with how, without any type of previous coordination. What's the point of moving uh, to a technology that costs you double and runs at half the speed. It just makes no sense. But this is the first time, and this is us, we've been evangelizing about using machine translation for decades without people listening to us. Now, because people are having their first experience with a with a chat bot system, an LLM system, they're telling us professionals, well, why don't you use chat GPT for translation? And you know, it's good anyway, you can, do all your German stuff and, and Polish stuff, and it, it looks good. It looks good to me. Get rid of all these translators. <laughs> it's ironic that people that were not listening <laughs> to, to the benefits of machine translation, rule-based statistical or neural, suddenly have become experts in 2023 and are telling us to get rid of everything and go for a system that costs double and runs at half the speed without thinking about the consequences of it. Um, it's quite ironic. And um, OK, I, I foresee the, that something like this may happen. For example, in the case of automa automated post editing, LLMs are, can be quite good for that. Automated once you've used a neural network. Um, and I've heard discussions about blockchaining the content. But blockchaining the content would. Uh, okay, it would bring a layer of safety and accountability, but 
but at a much, much higher cost, computational, you know, CO2 footprint, it, it would be ridiculous. It would be ridiculous. Um, so I go back to the chatbot story. You know, how responsible can I? I can can I trust it? Well, yeah, yeah, you can trust it for you, know, you can trust it for all your French content. But uh, but um, everything can come at a cost. Yeah, I think that that's also a, a good way to finish to uh, to you know acknowledge how broad this was. We talked about individuals, we talked about companies, businesses, we talked about governments, regulation, data, software. Yeah, I, I, like I said at the beginning, I think this is a very good way for us to uh, resume our convergence lectures with someone who uh, is able to discuss all over all of these these dimensions. Um, and yeah, uh, all in all, we, we need to know each other more as humans, as our expertise and our the way the systems of trust that we built so that we can really navigate in this world, right? And to use our, our experiences. Yeah, uh, so for my part, Manuel, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for what you gave us in this lecture. Um, you know, this is recorded and we'll probably post it in, in our YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and yes, so I guess the, the conversation will go on every time we meet. I'm sure that we will have more sure. themes to discuss. Yeah, so from my part, thank you very much to you and thank you very much for everyone who was attending this uh, this lecture here. Sabina, you want to close the session? No, only just to say thank you as well. Um, we don't need to duplicate ourselves. No, uh, uh, thanks, Manuel. Yes, certainly food for thought for the rest of this uh, semester, academic year, and then hopefully we. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> well, and then hopefully we see you again. Okay, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure as always, and Constantine, good to see you as well. Thanks everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank bye you. bye.